Well, good morning. I have no idea what that's an advertisement for in the middle where it says something about Sequoia. I don't know. So today we're going to talk about the fact that you are on a mission from God. You may not know it, and it's not as radical as putting the band back together. But, uh, but you are on a mission from God. So I'm going to give you some practical things about that today because the truth is that, you know, some of us know, okay, I've be, become a Christian and, you know, here's, I know that the Bible talks about discipleship and I have no idea what that means. And I actually heard a pastor, we were doing our video series this week on our Thursday Bible study, and he said, you know, if you're a Christian, and uh, you really ought to sit down and teach somebody how to pray. And I thought, well, that sounds really spiritual, but it's just not the way most of us learn. And I don't know how you learn, but I tend to learn by doing something. So we're going to do something this morning, and hopefully you'll remember this one thing. Apparently they remembered last night because literally when I was leaving the building, people kept saying it to me. So um, how many of you ever ran in a real race? You've run in a real official race of some kind, whether it's a 5K or maybe you ran track in high school or maybe as a little kid elementary. Okay, some of you did. So even if you didn't, I have a feeling that you have heard these three things. And it goes like this. And you're going to say the last one if you know it, okay? So it goes like this. It goes, on your mark, get set. Very good. It's almost like you knew what you were doing. Now, imagine, I used to run track. I ran, it's really funny, I ran the 100-yard dash, and then they changed it to meters. So for one year, I had all the records. It was awesome because they changed to a different measurement, so all the old records didn't count anymore. It was awesome. So for a year, I was the fastest person ever at the 100-meter dash in my school. And it's such a lie, but I can say that. So anyway... It's true, but it's just not true at the same time. And so um, imagine in a race if I said, on your mark, get set, and instead you said, nope. Imagine, you know, we used, to, we used to line up the blocks, and I can remember practicing. I had the spikes. I would change my spikes out before a race, depending on which kind of surface we were running on. And our school got a brand new track. Uh, When I was a a sophomore in high school, it was this wonderful track. And, of course, it was immediately spray-painted with graffiti and pornography and all kind of stuff. And they had to fix it immediately. It was so wonderful to live in Miami and grow up there. Anyway, so I remember lining up in the blocks, and you had to... You know, do it a certain way. I was right foot back, and, and I was one of the fastest out of the blocks. And today, when I was thinking about how Jesus has asked us to go that we literally just sit in the blocks. And more often than not, somebody would false start. And what that meant is they would say, on your mark, get set. And before they said go, somebody would go. And it happened every time. And in districts, I found out that several of the guys did it on purpose to throw the other runners off. Never knew that. That was fun to learn. And I was running against guys who would eventually be NFL football players. So you can imagine what it was like going to districts. And that was, that was awesome because I got to watch people run. Because I was behind them in the run. That's what that means. So I'll never forget. It was on your mark. You said go. And I literally started out of the blocks the fastest and then just watched people pass me. Couldn't do a thing about it. It's amazing how quick you can fall behind in 100 yards. But anyway, 100 meters. Anyway, so... Imagine going and just saying, nope, I'm not doing it. And I think a lot of believers, they recognize, if I said, do you think God wants you to do something? I think everybody would be like, yeah, he wants me to do something. And then I would say, what does he want you to do? And I don't know. I don't be a good person, read my Bible and go to church. And that's okay. That's a start. Those are some things he wants you to do. I hear you. But the truth is, our big calling is not about any of that. It's about as you learn and as you go, bringing other people with you. Because the way we learn is not in classrooms, although it's nothing wrong with a classroom. You can learn some things in classrooms, but most of you have training at work. How many of you love the training at work, right? Isn't that awesome to sit in a classroom with 50 other people and 
The best is to have somebody come over your shoulder or somebody with you who you can learn from and walk with. By the way, if you look at the disciples, the word discipleship, the idea of discipleship, especially in the Old Testament, meant in the dust of the master. The idea of a rabbi was the idea of the dust of the rabbi. It was watching someone live, and so you learned how to live. And so we're going to look at this idea today of on your mark, get set, Okay, and we're going to, it's a little, little downhill from the first time, but it's all right, it's all right. But I want to give you these, this idea that you have gifts, you've been given, and give you some practical ways to use the gifts and to be sent out. So we're going to look at Luke chapter 9, where Jesus sends out the disciples on a mission from God and help you to recognize that the truth is we've all been sent on mission from God. Number one, we are sent, first of all, with power from God. And now, now listen, you need to hear me. What I said to the kids this morning is absolutely true. The enemy will try to convince you, well, you're not like the other cows, right? You're not like the other people, therefore, God can't use you. No, everybody's different. You've created in the image of God, but that doesn't mean that you're as mellow as somebody else or you're as hyper as somebody else. Maybe you're opposite of me and you would never get up front here to talk to people. Well, that doesn't mean you can't be used by God. He sends everyone with his power. How do I know that? Because here's what it says in Luke chapter 9. All the disciples had their own personalities, and yet it says this. When Jesus had called the 12 together, he gave them, listen, power and authority to drive out demons, cure diseases, and he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And what's cool about this word sent, this word sent is where we get the word apostle. Every once in a while, somebody will come to me and we talk about the 12 apostles or the 12 disciples, right? Somebody will come to me and say, hey, I went to a church that has apostles. Whoa, whoa tell me about that. And I go, what do you want me to tell you about that? And they said, well, what does that mean that they're apostles? I said, well, I don't know what it means at that church, but I can tell you what the Bible means. Apostle means one who's sent, right? And so we would look today at apostles and they would be mainly missionaries, people who are sent from one place to another. We would say those are our apostles. They, in some churches, they use the word apostle like it's some super spiritual word. And if somehow you're an apostle, you're more important than the other people in that church and you get to tell everybody else what to do. It was exactly scripturally the opposite of that. An apostle basically went out to serve their community and to serve other people. And that's what Jesus sent the disciples to do. He gave them power. And yet the enemy tries to convince you, but you're not like other people. You don't have gifts. You don't have talents. You're, how are you going to change anybody? And the enemy comes to us. It would be like, do you remember Andre the Giant? Remember Princess Bride? One of my favorite scenes in Princess Bride is when Andre the Giant is wrestling Wesley. And if you look at one scene, you will see Andre the Giant's hands near Wesley's head. It is the most amazing thing I've ever seen in my life because the palm of Andre the Giant's hand is bigger. The palm, without the fingers, the palm is bigger than Wesley's head. And when I see that, I go... Oh my gosh, what would it have been like to even film with the guy? You just climb on top of him like it's no big deal. He doesn't even know you're there. And I thought, what if Danny DeVito showed up on set one day? <laughs> walked up to Andre the Giant, put his finger in his chest and said, Who do you, wait, who do you think you are? And imagine if Andre the Giant just let him push him around. Imagine if Andre the Giant said, yes, Mr. DeVito, whatever you need. You would be like, just want him away. And yet, when the enemy attacks you, you know, the Bible says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You have the authority of Andre the Giant and Satan is Danny DeVito. And you're worried about Danny DeVito. And you're letting the enemy talk to you and tell you you're not worthy, you don't matter, they don't like you. You don't like you, right? 
And we let the enemy pick on us, and we don't realize that God has given us authority. And if you want to know, it wasn't just at this time. Listen to a little bit later in Acts chapter 3. These were not the only people sent out. Listen to what it says here. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, listen, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I've called them. Now, I've got a time out here for a second because there's some really important people that are teaching about hearing God wrong. That's, I don't know a nicer way to say that. And there's two extremes to that. One is that when God speaks to you, it overrides Scripture. That's not true. The other is God doesn't speak to people at all outside of Scripture. That's absolutely not true. How do I know that? Because God spoke to people outside of Scripture and said, this is what you're supposed to do. It says the Holy Spirit spoke to them. Was it out loud? No. It was an impression. It was a prompting. And this is the way the Holy Spirit will speak to you. Number one, it will never go against Scripture. And most likely, it's going to be something that you wouldn't expect to do or be. For example, I cannot tell you the number of times that I've sensed all of a sudden, you need to call so-and-so. You need to check on so-and-so. And I, I, don't, I can't even go into the number of times it's happened now that I have called somebody or texted somebody or messaged somebody and said, hey, just wanted you to know I was praying for you today. Now, I didn't say, the Holy Spirit told me just now that you were sitting in your room and I was supposed to tell you that God loves you right now. Okay, nothing, you know. But I can tell you that so many times people, my phone rang with that person's name. I mean, they actually called, like with a voice. And I picked up the phone and they said, how did you know? And I go, I didn't know. So what happens? The Holy Spirit prompts you to do something. Now, be careful when you go to somebody else and say, God told me to tell you. (laughs) 99% of the time when somebody's done that to me, I'm instantly like, oh, yeah, okay. I've actually had to tell people, well, he hasn't told me yet. Harold Brantley told me one time he was sitting on the front row of a church and a lady came up and said, God told me I need to share something with the church. And he said, yeah, he hasn't told me to let you share. (laughs) That was great. Sorry, I didn't use that one last night. I like that story. So after they had fasted and prayed, what'd they do? They placed their hands on them and sent them off. The two of them on their way by the Holy Spirit went to Seleucida and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, which I love that name because it reminds me of Salami. (laughs) They proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. And so when when we say we want to follow scripture, so that means we got to go to synagogues. No. Why did they go to synagogues? You ready? This is huge. The, The theology behind this is just so deep. They went to synagogues because that's where they went all the time. Paul had been in synagogues thousands and thousands and thousands of times. And so when he became a Christian and now he had the gospel, he went where he always went until they kicked him out. But he went where he always went and shared. Listen, you don't have to go to a synagogue. But you got to go to work. I know you're trying to get out of it. I thought maybe God would tell me don't go. Yeah, that's not God. That's Reverend Sheets and Pastor Pillow. We call that we call that the Church of the Inner Spring, right? You never heard that? That's great. It's one of my favorites. All right. So so here's the deal. Here's the deal. Where should you minister? Wherever you are. Wherever you're called, where are you used to going? Is there a restaurant you go to? Well, when's the last time you said to the waitress, by the way, don't spend a half hour witnessing to the waitress. She may not mind, but the manager might. Okay, don't keep people from their jobs. I knew somebody who worked in a cubicle next to somebody and they would go and interrupt the other person's work in order to witness. And actually what they were doing is taking a break. And so, you know what I mean? Okay, so, so here's the deal. So what do you do? You say, hey, we're getting ready to pray for our meal. How can we pray for you? You see your neighbor out in the yard and you go, hey, I go to a men's breakfast on Wednesday mornings at 7.30 up at Kay's Barbecue. And you want to come? What? Yeah, you want to come? I'll I'll, I'll pay for your meal. Well, somebody will pay for it because I never get to pay. Somebody's always paying. 
That's actually true. Somebody pays for our meal every week. I can, I've tried to pay a few times and nobody will let me pay. When's the last time you went out of your way to look for an opportunity to pray for somebody or to let them know you're praying for them? I encourage you, if you have children that are far from the Lord, you don't have to be super spiritual with them. They know everything you believe most likely. You've probably told them 42 times. But you know what? Before you hang up, you can say, hey, I just want you to know I'm praying for you. I have friends who are atheists. When I tell them I'm praying for them, you know what they say? Thank you. I've only a couple of times in my life, a few times, I've been a pastor for like 30-something years now. Man, I'm old. 30-something years now. I know, you're like 30-something. That's nothing, right? So, so I've been pastor long enough that every once in a while I say to somebody, I'm praying for you, and they go, I don't need that. I don't need anybody to pray for me. <laughs> well, then I'm praying for you really hard. No, I don't say that. Just... <laughs> and what I want to say is, okay, I won't, but I don't, you know. I have lots of sarcasm, passive aggressiveness. I learned it from my family. We're Irish. <laughs> On your mark. Get set. Go. All right, here's your first thing. God has empowered me to minister to others. God has empowered me to minister to others. So when's the last time you said, God, would you use me this week? If you pray a prayer like that, can I tell you what's going to happen? God's going to use you this week. I, I often feel like that cow I saw this morning. I know that's a shocker to you guys. You know how many times in my life I've been told to be quiet? You know how many times in my life I was told to be still? Exodus 14, 14 is one of the hardest verses for me. Be still is what it says. And yet... God uses my noise. And God uses that brain of mine that just keeps running and running and running and running. And God will use you. You, you may not be the hyper cow. Maybe you're the mellow cow. By the way, don't tell your wife she's a mellow cow. That is really bad. <laughs> beautiful fawn. You're a beautiful fawn, honey. Number two. I better move along. Number two. We are sent as his ambassadors. We're sent as his ambassadors. So we represent him. You know, one of the awesome things, I have a friend who owns a restaurant in Orlando named Norman's. And Norman's a chef there. I don't know if you ever heard of that restaurant, but uh, it's a great restaurant. And my friend actually messaged me and said, I want you to go to my restaurant and meals on me. <laughs> I walked in the restaurant and I said, I'm Eric Brookins and I'm here. And I mean, I hadn't finished the sentence. There were people running at me. They took me to like the best table in the restaurant. They fed me the best food. Everything was on the house. The chef came out and talked to me. Asked me how I liked everything. I, I suddenly was like the owner of the restaurant. Why? Because the owner of the restaurant said, take care of him. When you're sent out in Jesus' name, God says, take care of him. God looks out for you. In Luke chapter 9, 3 through 5, it says this. He told them, it continues, Take nothing for the journey, no staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra shirt. Whatever house you enter, stay there till you leave that town. If people do not welcome you, leave their town. And you've probably heard this statement. Shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. What's that idea? It's, hey, when somebody doesn't treat you right, just leave what they said and did behind. Go to the next thing. So I had a church actually tell me, this is why you shouldn't pay pastors. Because Jesus sent them out with nothing. So let me give you the deep theology why Jesus had them bring no bag, no extra stuff. You ready? Because it was a short trip. Isn't that deep? We all know somebody or are married to somebody who's a packer. And what I mean by packer is literally pack rat. And when they go on a trip, if you're going to take them for a day or two days, they pack like you're going for a month. Now, the good news is that if you're with that person, no matter what happens, they're prepared. You're like, I didn't bring extra shoes. It's okay. I brought extra shoes for you. What? <laughs> There's always somebody like it. But here's the truth about life for so many of us. So many of us carry so much all the time. 
that it's hard for us to minister to others. Some of you are carrying guilt from your childhood or from somebody else or from something you did. Some of you are carrying shame. Some of you are carrying poor self-esteem because of what somebody said to you. And because of all that, when you get around other people, you ready? You're thinking about you. You're like a junior higher with a pimple on their face. I used to teach junior high and I'd see a kid like this and I knew what was going on. And when the kid finally moved his hand, you thought, ah, nobody can see that. But they could, right? The truth is, for some of us, because we're carrying so much of our past, we're carrying so much hurt, some of us, maybe it's stuff, literally stuff, that we can't minister to others. So what did Jesus say? Leave everything behind. Why? So you can care about the people where you go. Is anything keeping you from caring about the people where you go? Helping them, going out of your way to be a blessing to them. Let every man abide in the calling where he is called, and his work will be as sacred as the work of ministry. It is not what a man does that determines whether his work is sacred or secular. It's why he does it. So if you go to work and say, God, use me, guess what? You're a minister. You may not be a pastor, but you're a minister. You should be a minister. You have people to minister to. There are people in your life. You ready? You are called to minister to them. Some of them I will never meet. And if I did meet them, they wouldn't like me anyway. But you're near them. And so God's called you to minister to them. In 2 Corinthians, it says it this way. Paul says, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That's bringing people together. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. By the way, I don't know better news than that. And he has committed us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us we implore you on Christ's behalf be reconciled to God so how do we help other people God has called you to be a disciple but he's also called you to be a disciple maker so what do I do Eric do I need to start a class no how did you learn how to drive now some of you how many of you took driver's ed wow a lot of you took driver's ed okay you're better drivers than the rest of us I used to teach driver's ed we watch sad movies week after week. I remember that. So. But, but the truth is, right, most of us really how we learned was we drove with somebody. And my dad made it his mission our whole lives to teach us how to drive. But not only pointing out what was right, but pointing out what was wrong. Don't drive in the left lane like that. You see that? In Miami, he had lots of examples. I'll never forget one day we were in the left lane ready to turn and the guy in front of us started to go and stopped. My dad said, never do that. The light was still green and the guy sat in the first lane and my dad said, don't go, don't go, don't go, don't go. Sure enough, the guy got impatient, tried to go and somebody whacked him, hit him. He hit the car across from him and hit three cars on the left side. Bloom, 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 bloom. My dad said these words, better to wait than get the slop knocked out of you. Guess what I've never forgotten? <laughs> How do we learn most things? By watching others. You should be around some people who help you to grow. And you should be around some people that you can be an example to of growth. One of the reasons I love our men's prayer breakfast is some of our men have never prayed in groups of people. And so they come to the men's prayer breakfast and maybe they don't even pray. But they get to hear other men pray and they go, oh, you can just, that's all you got to do. I don't even think he closed his eyes, says the person with their eyes open. <laughs> you mean I don't have to pray long prayers? You mean I can just pray a sentence? And they learn how to pray. Why? From being around other people who pray. You realize most of the ways the disciples learned was not Jesus sitting down having classes with them. It was them following Jesus and watching what he did and saying, let's do what he did. And if you're going to be a disciple, you watch what others do. You say, God, I'm going to follow your word. I'm going to do what you've called me to do. And I'm going to help other people to follow you too. That's what it means to be a disciple. On your mark. Get set. Go. Here's your second thing. I need to be aware of God's calling to mission. I want you to pray this week. God, help me to recognize that I'm on mission every day. 
When you're at the gas station, you're on mission. When you're at work, you're on mission. When you go into a store, you're on a mission. So God, if I'm on a mission from you, like the Blues Brothers, what do you want me to do? And pay attention. And the Holy Spirit will prompt you. There'll be times that you say, hey, how's it going? And you'll see that a friend's down. Or a friend might say to you, I'm not doing good. And that might be your opportunity to just say, hey, I'll be praying for you. Or can I do anything to help you? Or maybe the Holy Spirit prompts you to bring a meal to somebody who's sick or to go out of your way to call somebody or whatever it is. Just do what God's called you to do. Number three, we are sent with His message and help. So how do we learn? The best way to learn is by teaching somebody else. I was a biology major in college. I could not remember the order of the planets. I just couldn't. I had such a hard time remembering them. And I don't know why. I would, I would get them right on the test and then forget them the next day. If somebody said, what's the order of the planets? I'd be like, I don't know. But then I had to teach it. I taught Danielle's class. And I had to teach the planets. And here's what I realized. You had mercury, which if you remember, that's what thermostats were made of, or thermometers. And so I remember thermometer next to the sun. That's easy, mercury. And then Venus, like a Venus flytrap. And then I knew what third rock from the sun was. I watched that show before right? So we know that's earth. And then I knew if we were going to go anywhere, we were going to fly to Mars. So I knew that had to be pretty close, right? So Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars. And then there was some dumb planet. I can't remember. Oh, but look at the three before Pluto, which is or isn't a planet today. Did you know the three planets before Pluto spell sun, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, sun? How did I learn that? Because I had to teach it to somebody. And I went, oh, that spells sun, I probably should have noticed that a while ago. So you got four planets right there. And then if you can just remember Jupiter, you're good. So you got Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto. And you go, wow, I got them all. Why? Because you teach somebody else. Listen, if you want to grow in your Christian life, find somebody who wants to grow that you're just a little bit ahead of, that you've been a Christian just a little longer. And I don't mean ahead of like you're more spiritual than they are. And just begin to show them how to live. Begin praying. Invite them to Bible study. Invite them to some. Go, go to lunch with them. They'll watch how you pray for a meal. They'll listen to how you interact with people. They'll pay attention to how you treat the waitress or the waiter. Be an example. To, that's what discipleship means. It's not just you taking a class or leading a class. It's about living life with People, but we've forgotten that when Jesus said go, that we have to go. Can't just keep sitting at home. Luke 9, 6. So they set out and went from village to village proclaiming the good news and healing people everywhere. That word set out basically is where we get the word exit. They exited. In a minute, in just a couple of minutes, you're going to leave here. And that's where your mission begins. Whatever you do next. And it could be while I was talking today, God put somebody on your heart that you can pray for. I want to encourage you to pray for them. Do you know anybody who's sick? Pray for them. Eric, I don't know anybody who's physically sick. Do you know somebody who's emotionally sick? Do you know somebody who's spiritually sick? Start praying for them. God has given you the power to pray for people and God can change their life. Who have you given up on praying for? Start praying for them. Leave your past behind. Leave your regrets behind. Lay your sins at the feet of Jesus. Travel light and love the people around you. Listen to what Jesus said to his disciples, Matthew 28. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth have been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the end of the age. You're not doing this on your own. God is with you. On your mark, get set. Go. I've been sent as a disciple maker. Last Saturday or Sunday, Charles Stanley passed away. And he's, not, he's about 90. And his son wrote on Twitter and a few other places that when he went to see his dad the last time on Saturday, that normally he said to his dad, hey, can I pray for you? And this time his dad said, let me pray for you. And he prayed with Andy, who's another pastor. And then he said to him, Andy, I just want you to know, I'm so proud of you. 
Now, Andy Stanley could have talked about the hundreds and thousands of people that have become Christians because of Charles Stanley. He could have talked about all the presidents and all the important people that he influenced. But you know what Andy Stanley talked about? What his dad said to him. Listen, you may not feel like the most important person in the world. But there are people who you need to say, I'm proud of you. There are people around you who maybe you can say, can I help you? Can I pray for you? Can I encourage you? And it'll be a bigger deal than any TV pastor, any pastor they see or hear, because you'll be ministering to them. God has called you on a mission. So look for ways to fulfill that mission this week. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that before you leave today. You can surrender your life to Him knowing that Jesus died to pay for our sins. We're messed up. We're broken. And when we say, Jesus, I surrender my life to you, I want to follow you the rest of my life. When we say that and mean it, the Bible says he takes our sins and gives us his righteousness. He gives us power to live. And you're called to a mission. So if you want to talk about that after service, I'll be here. I'd love to pray with you about being a Christian. Maybe you're here today and there's somebody God put on your heart. Hey, you're on a mission. Make sure you go and don't just stay. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time today. Thank you for your word, your power, your strength. I thank you that you've called us to ministry. Lord, I thank you that you've called us to do and to serve and to go. Lord, help us to go. Help us to do what you've called us to do. Help us to be sensitive to your spirit and your power. Lord, thank you for this time today. Bless each one in Jesus' name. Amen.